let's begin with the thing that's on everyone's mind today, which is the uh, Supreme Court ruling on uh, the health care mandate. Today's ruling uh, by the Supreme Court under Chief Justice John Roberts uh, that the health care mandate is in fact a tax and that that tax is constitutional. Uh, the question I have is, should we now believe with that ruling, like Lysander Spooner did in his No Treason, uh, The Constitution of No Authority, that the American Constitution has been so irreparably warped or ignored that we can no longer look to it for answers to uh, tyrannical government? What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think the decision should make pretty clear to everybody that this, this fantasy notion that people have been taught to have about the Supreme Court, that these are, these are platonic overlords, they are, they're not like you and me, they are entirely disengaged from everyday concerns and they can just purely contemplate the rights and wrongs of something. It, it's just, it's just, it's just that, it's just a fantasy that, well, what, how could it possibly be a coincidence that the four left liberals on the court all just by an interesting happenstance happened to find that Obama's law was perfectly fine and with, with some caveats, of course. And whereas the other, the, the four uh, more or less conservatives found the opposite. But we comfort ourselves, or Americans are taught to comfort themselves, uh, by thinking that, don't worry, because the Constitution will be enforced because we have these people who are above the rough and tumble of politics, and they are there to make sure that it's observed. It doesn't seem to me that that's the case at all, that all we're doing is just repeating. We just have another layer of, of political debate going on. Now we have a layer where we have to have nine extra people after the 535 in Congress and the one president have looked at something, then nine more people have to decide whether they think it's a good idea, all under the guise of deciding upon its constitutionality. Now, in, in terms of the, the decision itself, it seems to me that there ought to be some limit to the taxing power if, if Roberts is going to argue that the key, the linchpin of the case is that the mandate is just a tax and it's not a penalty, it's a tax, and the federal government has the authority to tax, so there's nothing wrong with it. It seems like the limit, there should be a limit on the power to tax, that the power to tax ought to be limited by the enumerated powers of the Constitution. If the federal government can evade the enumerated powers by simply doing its obnoxious things in the form of taxes, then, well, then all the attempts to limit power will have come to naught. Uh, and I, I do believe there were people who did want to limit power and did think that the Tenth Amendment, other mechanisms in the Constitution did do that. But it seems like no matter how much you try, there's always going to be some loophole that people who want to find these loopholes will find. And so I think it is at this point more and more clear that it is unreasonable to expect that some Supreme Court or some piece of paper is going to restrain ambitious people who want to use the coercive power of the state to benefit themselves and their constituents. There, it is unreasonable to expect that. So I think Spooner was correct. Well, these are employees of the federal government. I, I'm kind of a, a little surprised that even some of our liber libertarian peers were surprised by the ruling. It's, this is a branch of the federal government. Of course, they're going to rule in favor of themselves. Right, and I've tried. I, I argued that in my book Nullification, mm -hmm. and I have a, I have a resource on that online, statenullification.com, and I talk about that issue there. Uh, that of course, the, you know, the the courts, the court is not some separate thing. That uh, this sort of impartial third party that's brought in, it, it is part of the problem. It is, it is part of the federal government. Now, that's not to say that it never rules against the federal government. I can think of a couple cases in recent years in which it, it did this. There was the, the Morrison case, right. which involved uh, the issue of violence against women, and there was the Lopez case involving gun-free school zones. But mm -hmm. the fact that I can name those to you is, is <laughs> a little disturbing, right? I mean, there should be a whole, whole laundry list of them, right. but there, there, really, there really isn't. Uh, so it's not impossible that they would rule uh, against the federal government in the same way that it's not impossible that your mother if she were adjudicating a dispute between you and your friend, your mother might rule in favor of your friend, but pretty unlikely. But I think part of the reason that some libertarians were surprised by the decision was that we'd heard so much in the media, like leaks or whatever, that seemed to suggest that 
the overturning of Obamacare was practically in the bag. Like, the, like this is what the impression people were getting. And even through that, I was predicting that it would be upheld. And I say this not to toot my own horn, because I generally don't make predictions. I'm afraid of being wrong. That's why I'm a historian. I'm always right. These things have already happened. I'm always right. But I was, you know, I'm always afraid of being wrong. And I'm not like there's any shame in making an incorrect prediction. But on this, I felt like, no, there's just no way it's, it's going to happen. But it didn't turn out the way I expected. I'll admit that. I, I expected it to be uh, Roberts voting to uh, overturn and uh, Anthony Kennedy voting to uphold it. And those two actually were reversed, as it turns out. But, right. but by and large, the res but the result was the same. Um, speaking of Roberts voting to uphold it, an argument I've heard from a lot of people in favor of still voting for Romney in the general election is that he might appoint better judges and that might also, he might help us get rid of the health care bill, things like that. Well, he, I think he says something to the effect of wanting to appoint judges like Roberts and Roberts ended up <laughs> yeah. voting for, uh, um, coming down on that decision. Um, so what would you say in general to some of the more serious conservatives and libertarian type Republicans who think, um, even understanding that there's almost no difference between Romney and Obama, that there might be some marginal difference on judges or the health care bill or something that they might prefer Romney on, and on the flip side, people who also understand the marginal differences and understand that Obama has been uh, just as much of an imperialist and uh, an abuser of civil liberties as Bush, but think that even given that, that Romney would be even worse on foreign policy and civil liberties. People who think that there's that minute difference that might make it matter one way or the other, what would you say to them? Well, I think it's very hard to measure. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if I think of somebody as being somewhat worse on foreign policy and somewhat better on some other thing, these are incommensurable things. It's hard for me to say, well, this outweighs that. They're both pretty bad. Right. I, I mean, and, and I think both of these individuals are such reprehensible human beings and stand for such horrible ideas that at some point you simply have to say, I can't continue to give my consent to this system. And, and in fact, I refuse to vote for somebody who behind my back is laughing his you-know-what off at me, mm -hmm. that I'm such a gullible mm -hmm. idiot that I would be sucked in to choosing between uh, these two hand-picked Wall Street candidates, which is what both of them are. Right. Uh, so I do understand the, the concern about judges, but that just goes to show we need some type of major, uh, if, if we're going to continue to put our, our, our uh, energies into politics, we need a major judicial reform. There needs to, I mean, the fact that everybody's terrified that so-and-so might appoint uh, three people, three people in a country of over 300 million, we are terrified that three more people might be in some influential position. Doesn't that indicate that that position is too influential? Absolutely. That it has too much power? That maybe it needs to be scaled back? There needs to be a scaling back of the Supreme Court. That can be done under the Constitution as written. It already includes a provision that allows the Congress to strip the, the federal courts of jurisdiction over whatever issues it wants. We need to think in terms of that instead of thinking, well, every four years we'll wage a low-intensity civil war between two pretty similar candidates over who gets to appoint these people. Maybe just make the people not so influential in the first place. I mean, think of fundamentally, instead of treating the symptoms, treat the disease. Uh, the other thing would be, the way I think of it is that, yeah, I think, I think Romney would be marginally worse and maybe even moderately worse on foreign policy. He would, he would appoint uh, horrible people that, that real conservatives, of whom there are about, I don't know, 28 left, and libertarians would be horrified by. I mean, John Bolton would be uh, Secretary <laughs> of State, po quite possibly. Uh, Joe Lieberman would possibly oh, be yeah. in, in, involved. I mean, these are, these are people that the robots who read National Review would cheer. But somebody like, a, like an old, I don't know, an old-timey, you know, limited government, uh, finite expectations of government sort of conservative would be horrified by it. Of course, a libertarian would be just appalled by these people. That's pretty terrible. And the fact that he promises a few marginal changes that I might welcome just can't possibly outweigh that. And, and in particular, I mean, let's think of what these marginal changes might be. Taxes, well, I don't think there really are going to be major changes in taxes under a, a Romney because I don't think the Democrats would actually allow the Bush tax cuts to expire. I think they see the economy as 
still very weak. They don't want to be responsible for that. Uh, continuing, so I don't think they would vote to to uh, let those taxes expire. So already, I think that's already in the bag. Romney has already said he wants to close some loopholes, which is another way of saying raise taxes. So I'm not so convinced on the tax front. On the spending front, Romney has said that Ron Paul's plan to cut a trillion dollars out of the budget, which of course is the only sensible approach, is uh, destined to create a depression. That, that <laughs> he thinks government spending cuts lead to depressions. Well, I could get that from the New York Times. I could get that from Obama. And I'm supposed to vote for this guy because he's marginally better on some unknown thing. Well, Obamacare, he'll repeal that. He's promised it after all. Well, you know, a lot of people promise a lot of things and almost none of them ever seem to happen. But the second thing is, what, what's really going to happen on this? I mean, probably you'd get some kind of a replacement for it that would be, well, at, you know, 20% better. I, at the, it would be the most you could you could hope for uh, in in this situation. So again, I don't see that that's enough to make me not find him an absolute. I mean, at some point you have to say this man it, or woman is an insult to my intelligence. The things that I know he stands for are horrible. He changes his mind constantly, but yet it's so odd that every position he changes his mind to is still bad. Like, <laughs> he still can't quite get the right position on, on basically anything. At some point, you have to say, you know what? I can't be part of this anymore. Right. I can't be part of the pro-bailout, anti-civil liberties, totally insane bullet-in-China shop foreign policy that is causing us nothing but grief, that is guaranteed to lead to disaster, and that, incidentally, hasn't even been a success on its own terms. Everywhere it's touched has yielded more Islamic fundamentalism. So it's not mm -hmm. even like they've had any successes. It's been a disaster everywhere. There's no way you can vote for that guy. And then Obama, of course, is a disaster for a million other reasons. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it's actually a net benefit for Romney that the Supreme Court came down the way it did. Some people are saying this decision guarantees Obama will be reelected. That's totally wrong. What it means is that finally Romney has something to differentiate himself from right. um, Obama on. If, if the Supreme Court had overturned Obamacare, then he's got almost nothing to run on because they agree on so much. Uh, they give slightly different speeches, but what was he going to run on? Now he can run on this. And people say, well, how can he run on this? He's the author of Romney Care. Right. <laughs> but, but bear in mind, apparently the electorate doesn't seem to be bothered by the fact that he reverses himself constantly. This apparently is not a problem, uh, according to the 75 and overs who came out in droves to vote for him. That This does not bother them. The, the they don't have, Cognitive dissonance doesn't work for these people. So I think it gives him uh, finally a focus for his campaign. And uh, just today I was reading people all over Facebook saying, you know, I was on the fence with Romney, but now I'm definitely voting for him. This is a huge oh, no. plus for him. Yeah, no, I, I definitely see that. Uh, I mean, even though he was the one that originally authored uh, the mandate uh, upon which the health care, the new national health care mandate is is based. So we've talked about uh, now the two bad options we have to vote for for president. Let's talk about the good option we once had. 